So, I skipped Ardme last year because I felt there wasn't enough stuff to talk about that time. Evidently, Ardman said, well, we'll see about that, and in the interim brought us a new movie, a new TV special, and a contribution to an anthology TV series. And that's on top of having a show I never heard about before, and of course, more ads and music videos. Ardman may be slow on their content, but they know how to get it done. So, let's get into it with Ardme 2024. First up, we're going to look at the big one, the highly anticipated sequel to what is still the highest grossing stop motion film ever, Chicken Run 2. I've made it no secret that I've been skeptical of this project since day one. Hell, it got announced all the way back when I did the first ARP in 2018. My god, has it really been that long? So I wasn't necessarily looking forward to this, but even with that doubt, I still went in with an open mind and tried to see how it was. And to be honest, I actually really loved it. No buts about it, this is a really fun movie. It's not as good as the first one, but it's clear it's trying to be a different movie, and I appreciate that and I think it was the right way to go. And it clearly paid off with a really fun, colourful, and creative movie that feels like a worthy follow-up to the previous film. The film picks up more or less right after where the last one did, with Ginger, Rocky, and the rest of the hens living on their bird sanctuary island, and the pair of them are excited to meet their new chick, Molly, played by Bella Ramsey, who definitely has her mum's tenacity and drive and her dad's urge to be free and have adventures, but of course, Ginger is scared of the world outside the island and tries to make sure Molly never goes out there. But she just can't help herself and manages to get to the mainland and runs into the scouser hen called Frizzle, no relation, played by Josie Sedgwick Davis, who are both then taken to supposedly chicken paradise. But this place, for as nice as it seems, appears to have a dark side to it and is lauded over by someone perhaps from her parents' past. First thing to mention about this movie is that it's definitely not aiming for the heavy drama and dark tone that the first movie had. This one is bright, upbeat, and focuses more on its jokes than its conflict. But, as I said, I think that was a good way to go, since it helps differentiate it from the first movie, and they don't do it in a cheap way either. They have good jokes and still have time to let the characters be themselves and have their moments, but without getting too heavy. Basically, this is the Gremlins 2 to the first movie's Gremlins, and... I like Gremlins 2, so that works out perfectly. Though this movie does have more depth and nuance to it than Gremlins 2, the conflict with Ginger's motherly instincts and Molly's urge to be free is a good conflict, and while it does remind me a little too much of Little Mermaid 2, it's nowhere near as bad as that. And most of the movie's plot is very good, especially since while the first movie felt like a war prison movie, this one feels more like a heist movie, which was a brilliant idea to switch it up. The hens breaking into the new high-tech chicken farm is really cool and allows Arman to use use their natural creativity with using household objects in a funny and clever way, which is something they've always excelled at, plus the design of the chicken farm just looks awesome. Like this sci-fi imperial warship with an outside design that looks like Tracy Island. It's great. It also allows them to use a bit more of their trademark background jokes, which were sorely lacking in the first movie, which are always some of my favourite bits of an Arman production. The animation evolution since the first movie is really clear too. The colours are just so much more vibrant, and even even the characters seem a lot more expressive now, and while some of them do look a little too cartoony, they really utilise the amount of expression they can get out of them. Plus, the integration with more digital effects is pretty seamless, much better than Early Man, which was pretty obvious how much the backgrounds were CG in that movie. Though, I guess it'll be more excusable for them using more CGI in the future since they've apparently run out of plasticine, which is like Pixar running out of computers or Disney running out of lawyers, but hey, these things happen. So is there Anything I don't like about this movie? Well, yes, there is. One of the big controversial elements of this movie was in how the old voice actors had been replaced. And to be fair, with some it makes sense, with Fowler since his original voice actor is dead, and Rocky, whose original voice actor is a lunatic, but a lot of the ones they did replace don't make any sense. The only original voice actors who stayed are Imelda Staunton, Jane Horrocks, Lynn Ferguson, and Miranda Richardson. I made her a bicycle. Oh. Not a plan! That's just saying what you wish would happen. Aye, and 12 herrings in a bagpipe are just a pile of mints if you haven't kent the rules! Who, I think we can agree that they were the best cast members of the original, so I'm glad they're still here, and they still do a fantastic job. But Ginger's voice actress, Julia Swahala, was replaced by Thandie Newton, who, granted, is a great actress and does a decent job. Look, I know it looks like a million to one shot, but we know the layout, 
and Mac thinks there's a way in. But it does seem odd to replace her with Bandy, especially when she's not even British. Nick and Fetcher got replaced by Romish Ranganathan and Daniel Mays respectively, and I do like both of them, Romish especially, but again, why replace Timothy Spall and Phil Daniels? Both of them are awesome. This makes you happy and brainless, apparently. Yeah, I feel it. <laughs> it's amazing. Mate. I haven't turned it on yet. Zachary Levi and David Bradley as the replacements for Rocky and Fowler were perfect though. In fact, I think I like Levi's performance better than Mel Gibson since, well, now it sounds like he has genuine emotion and sincerity in his voice. And, actually, it's a, it's a pretty good story. Plus having him dance the closing theme of Bottom doesn't hurt. <laughs> And Bradley, well, it's David Bradley, of course he's going to be good. Just as Whizbang Charlie thought we were back in play, enemy fire at six o'clock. Apparently, a lot of these replacements were the fault of Netflix, who demanded more diverse and Hollywood recognizable actors for market appeal, which just seems like a really stupid idea to me. I mean, it's Bloody Chicken Run 2, a sequel to one of the most popular kids' movies of all time. Why do you need to make it more appealing? Again, the replacements do fine, it's just those who could come back I would have liked to have seen come back, especially Spall. He's one of my favourite actors, and to see him get snubbed, that really sucks. Also, the character of Frizzle does seem kind of pointless in the overall story. She really has no function other than just moving the plot forward, so I feel like they didn't really need her. The only other minor issue I have is with, and this is where we're getting into spoilers, so be prepared here, Mrs. Tweedy, who, yes, is somehow back after getting crushed under a massive barn door, but I guess considering what happens to her in this movie, she's pretty much indestructible. Now, Miranda Richardson does do a great job like she did last time, but her character is no way near as terrifying as she was previously. I think part of that comes from how she's surprisingly not expressive in her model as she was last time, which given the upgrade from the last movie's technology is a real surprise, but Miranda does also seem to be doing a much more laid-back performance this time, and there's no moments where she gets as pants crappingly terrifying as this. You are going to be a pie! Get the chickens. Which ones? All of them. But she is still a great baddie, and it is awesome to see her go through more emotions than she did the last time and have a genuine grudge against Ginger, which is impressive that she recognises her, but yeah, to see her go full evil genius is great. Also, the new villains, Dr. Fry and Reginald Smith, are good too, the latter especially because... Well, it's Peter Serafinowicz, he's always awesome. But besides those minor issues, this is a really fun and entertaining movie that doesn't try too hard to overcome the milestone that was the previous movie, and it paid off for them. I really highly recommend this one. But next time, we'll be taking a look into another bird-themed production by Aardman. So, Aardman decided to venture into a new Christmas special that wasn't Wallace and Gromit, and is actually about Christmas, with a standalone called Robin Robin. But does it work on its own, or does it just make us wish we had the cheese duo back? A stray Robin chick is found by a family of mice and taken in by them and raised as one of their own. But given that she's not a mouse, that means she has trouble with sneaking around for food and avoiding trouble. But her family still loves her, but they still need to eat, so she tries one last time on Christmas Eve to get some food. But on her way, she comes across a magpie who tells her about the shiny wishing star at the top of the spiky tree and tells her that if they get that they'll have whatever they wish for. So this short is very simple in terms of its plot and layout. It's a very typical old school style Christmas special but I like that. I love those humble little Christmas specials and this really reminds me of something I would have seen on TV as a kid myself. It was very nostalgic to me in that regard. It really does have the feel of a British Christmas despite snow being everywhere. When was the last time we had a white Christmas in this country? Especially when they're in the house. It reminds me a lot of the house scenes from The Snowman or the Kevin the Cara Aldi ads. I always love a Christmas special that really captures the mood of the season. The voice acting's pretty good too. The Robin and her family do basically what is needed for their roles. You can't sneak a whole sandwich. How do you sneak a sandwich? Like this. <gasps> I love Richard E. Grant's magpie character. He reminds me a lot of Jeremy from The Secret of Nim, but with the voice of a slightly less Femi C-3PO. It's great. Let's get you safe indoors, eh? Oh, thanks. Is the cat still- 
poor little thing. And Gillian Anderson's cat, as in the cat she voices, not the cat she owns, just sounds so deliciously evil. It's the little bird who sneaks about on the floor like a mouse. And this is certainly a better fit for her than the last time she voiced a villain in a stop-motion franchise. But the biggest thing to talk about with this special is its style and its look. It's really interesting to see Aardman not only using a new art and craft style with more felt-based models, which reminds me a lot of those Wes Anderson stop-motion films or My Life as Courgette, but to also have something a lot more nature and atmosphere based. Now of course Aardman has ventured into things that indulge the beauty of nature before with Shaun the Sheep and Atmosphere with Chicken Run, and even some of the early Wallace and Gromit shorts, but never to this degree. They tend to stick more to artificial and man-made themes and environments, so this is really a new thing for them. It reminds me a lot of Bambi, truth be told. The animation is very different too. Aardman tends to have very smooth frame rates and all feels very laminar and consistent. Here it's a lot more choppy, but in a purposeful way, like the Spider-Verse movies, and it works really well. It gives it an old-school feel, like a British stop-motion show from the 80s, and it works really well for the quiet and atmospheric tone. It also reminds me a lot of the animated specials based on the work of Julia Donaldson and Alex Scheffler and while those were mostly done with CGI, they did look as if they were trying to emulate stop motion in their style, and the colour and lighting is definitely similar here. Even the designs of the models don't look like Artman. Usually with almost all Artman productions, they follow the style of either Nick Park or Peter Lord, each of whom styles are very distinctive. But here, no, it's a much more simple style that kind of looks like a stop motion version of the CalArt style, which is ironic since Artman was an influence for the CalArt style, but that's just how it is. It feels so different from other Aardman productions in every aspect since it's a musical which is extremely rare for Aardman. I think this is the first time they've done a musical and they're not bad songs. They're nothing special but they're cute. Crumbs and crust and stale bread, soggy flakes and thin tracks. Although the one song that the magpie sings is a complete rip-off of See My Vest from The Simpsons. This chair, hedgehog hair, pepper clips, I've got the pair. Grizzly bear underwear, turtles necks, I've got my shit. Which is again ironic since Matt Groening's style was also heavily influenced by Aardman. Though the cat's villain song is really good and almost sounds weirdly sexy. Even if Gillian's not the best singer, she does do a good job here. You could be sitting snug perfectly. You don't fit in, but you'd fit into my belly. Although cute is definitely a word that exemplifies this special, it is very cute. Which is also something that Aardman doesn't directly go for. They certainly have their cute elements and they always are super charming, but they don't always go for the ah moments. But here they do, and they don't feel cheap or pandering at all. It fits with the tone and story. Though it is funny that it's so cute given that real world Robins are vicious bastards. Seriously, there's a reason you only ever see Robins on their own. They fight other Robins to the death if another one enters their territory. You ever wonder why their breasts are red? Now that would have turned this special from a cute little Christmas show into another Watership Down. Not that I'd object to that. Regardless, while the story and characters are rather typical for the genre, the look of it is what really sells it, and it really exemplifies Aardman's skill with taking simple things but making them special through things like the look and the charm of it. And it's really great. I wouldn't put this up there as one of my favourite Christmas specials like a Mickey's Christmas Carol or even Bottom's Holy episode, but it is really cute and I think I will put it on again this Christmas. Christmas. But join us next time when Arben ventures into a franchise in a galaxy far, far away. So, Arben teaming up with Star Wars. I honestly never thought I'd see the day, it just seems like two things that would never join together. But they did here. This is an episode of the Star Wars anthology series Star Wars Visions, so it's a self-contained standalone story that doesn't tie into anything directly to any of the other major stories. But as a little world-building short with the style of animation that the franchise hasn't ventured into before, it's pretty good. As far as the plot goes, it's more or less just your typical underdog versus uptype snob race story. It's basically the plot of Cool Runnings but with Star Wars. But that's no bad thing, and despite the lack of story originality, 
it's pretty charming and a cute short. To discuss in more detail, basically a young girl on Tatooine, because of course it's Tatooine, it's always that planet in Star Wars, why give Hoth or Endor some more love, is hoping to compete in a mother-daughter freighter race. But there's just one problem. Her mother is a junk and scrap hauler, so her ship isn't as glamorous as the big champs one. But perhaps with some teamwork, they might just be able to beat them. It is so surreal seeing the Star Wars iconography in the Ardman style. It'd be like seeing a Mortal Kombat game done in the style of the Teletubbies, though I would not be against seeing that. But while Ardman has ventured into sci-fi a few times, they've never gone this far with it, so it's weird seeing these humble British plasticine puppets in a world that is possibly the biggest sci-fi film franchise that has ever existed. Although, it's also fitting that a lot of the cast are British because, well, most of the cast in Star Wars films are British, and it's often filmed in Britain too. Although, granted, they don't go in for as many regional accents as this special does. What's up with Z1? Nothing now. All fixed. This just makes me wonder where in the Star Wars universe the Yorkshirian Twi'leks come from. Then again, given how Bib Fortuna ends up looking in the Boba Fett spin-off, I could believe he's from the North. My ass! However, this is more than just a Star Wars story by Ardman. The Ardman charm is everywhere in this special, from the mum's astromech being like a dog, the welding mask looking like the Mandalorian's faceplate, the cameo from the 50s cooker robot from a grand day out in the background, or hell, everything they do with the Wookiees is just so Ardman. And of course, Ardman give us their trademark background gags like they always do, and this is probably the perfect place to use stuff like like that given how busy Star Wars environments are, so there's plenty of nooks and crannies to put gags into. Beyond that, there's not too much to talk about beyond the mind-buggering of the fact that Ardman and Star Wars have joined forces. Not to say that the special is bad, it's not, it's incredibly charming and sweet, but nothing that we've seen before, it's more or less just the novelty of it being Star Wars that helps it stand out. But this does use the Star Wars setting and theming to great advantage, and like I said, that Ardman sense of humour works surprisingly well in it. The animation is nothing too special compared to what we've seen before. Truth be told, it reminds me a lot of the Pirates movie, and that had some of the best animation Ardman's ever had, so it was a good star to go with for this movie. However, it certainly does give you a sense of momentum during the race scene, and it reminds me a lot of the train chase in the wrong trousers, especially the way with the mum dangles off the back of the ship at the end reminds me of Wallace getting stuck on the back of the train in that special. Though this time it makes sense that the area they're racing in is so damn long, as opposed to Wallace's house seemingly being 15 miles wide. But it does lead to a very fun race sequence and is nowhere near as long and tedious as the last time Star Wars decided to do a race scene. Overall, it's nothing too significant to either franchise as it represents, but the fact that it's even a thing is cool and a great way to show that Star Wars can have more charm to it beyond what it already is, and can experiment when it wants to and have it work. Unfortunately, not all experiments work, and the next time we'll be looking at a rather failed experiment from Ardman that I previously had no idea was even a thing, and frankly I was better off not knowing about it. But we'll just have to dive right in and chop the chicken on that one. Okay, so turns out I was wrong the last time, and there is another Ardman CGI TV series, and I'd never heard of it. Mostly because it was broadcast on Cartoon Network, and I didn't have that channel growing up. But after seeing it... I can safely say I wasn't missing out on much. The plot is nothing too special. It's set in a time that resembles 70s exploitation kung fu movies, but all the inhabitants are anthro-animals, and it focuses on the three most skilled chicken martial artists fighting against their evil fish arch-enemy. Basically, it's the plot of Super Duper Sumos but with chickens, though none of these cocks have the gumption of Master Chicken from Kung Fu Panda. I will concede this is far from the worst show Ardman has ever made. It's nowhere near as annoying as Angry Kid and not as blistering unfunny as Planet Sketch, but it's nothing really to celebrate over, it's just a generic action kids show with decent animation and occasionally a decent joke. The animation reminds me a lot of the 2012 TMNT series, especially due to it being martial arts related, but this is clearly nowhere near as good in look, or writing for that matter. It's certainly decent animation, and the style does have a little bit of the Ardman flair to it, and I can admit on a technical level for the time it is impressive, especially compared to Ardman's previous CGI show attempt, but it's nothing all that special now. I do appreciate how stretchy and animated it is. It can get a little grating with them having movement for the sake of movement, which can get 
annoying, but at least it's well made. And I like the textures and art style. It's very unique for Ardman and has a very stylized feel to it, even if it does look incredibly early 2000s, though this came out in 2007, so it was a bit out of date even when it came out. But hey, it does look good and has style to it. I'll give it that. The voice acting is good. I'll give them that as well. And some of the characters have different voices in the UK version, such as Chucky Chan. Yes, seriously. And this guy has nowhere near the skills of Rugrats Chucky Chan, who is voiced by Rob Rackshaw in the UK version, who you may recognize as James from Thomas the Tank Engine and Professor Professor from The Secret Show. The characters themselves are nothing really that sticks out with you. They're pretty typical Saturday morning cartoon archetypes. The cool black dude, the tough tomboy, the sometimes wise, sometimes goofy mentor, the weedy kid, the brat, and the egomaniacal big bad. But they're by no means annoying, and they do have some decent lines now and then. Also, the bad guy is voiced by Paul K, aka the voice of Vince from Mongrels, and what I wouldn't give for Vince to be in this. I could only imagine he'd have some strong words for these chickens. F chickens. Go back where I belong. F chickens. Come all the way to Hong Kong all the way to Hong Kong indeed. I also want to say Rocky came up with that joke and I am internally happy that she did because I'm sure I would have missed that and kicked myself for doing so. Beyond that, I don't really have much to say about this. Like I said, it's just a typical Saturday morning cartoon that's done a bit tongue in cheek, but even in that description, there are better shows like that from this generation, like the original Ben 10 and Buzz Lightyear of Star Command. If this show was around when I was a kid, I can't imagine I would have been that interested. Granted, I was growing out of cartoons by that time, but I remember a lot of very mediocre shows like this coming out around that time, like League of Super Evil and Free Phonics, and I didn't really care much for those back then either. Like I said, it's not a bad show, but nothing I'm going to come back to anytime soon, and Armin have done much better stuff with less, which we'll be seeing plenty of next time. Yep, we got another smorgasbord of ads to look at again this year, and I really love doing these. Not only because they're always so good, but Ardman really put their all into these ads when they don't really need to, but they still treat them as if they're as important as Wallace and Gromit or any of their other big franchises, and I really appreciate them for that. So, let's take a look at some of them now. Oh, and as for those This Is My BBC Idents, I feel that they're not really worth mentioning. They're good, but... It's just Creature Comforts again. There's not enough new about it to give me material to work with. Unlike... So let's start with a series of ads that Ardman did especially for America. And hopefully this time no lunatic future presidents pop up in this one. With the Chevron car ads. Which is ironic since Chevron originated in the UK. These ads are basically done in the style of Creature Comforts, but this time they're scripted. With the cars speaking about situations they've been in, and slipping in the reasons why they're good cars to use. But I think she tries to make up for it. She gives me Chevron Supreme with Tecron, because I'm a car designed for high octane gas. It's actually quite clever, and feels very well flowing and natural for an ad, but... Of course, the big thing that stands out is the animation on the cars. Anthropomorphizing cars is a notoriously tricky thing to do, and has been done to varying degrees of success or failure before. But here, it's pretty good. The scale and shape of the car makes them look more cartoony, so the surreal quality of it being a talking car is easier to swallow. The use of the windscreen wipers as eyebrows is a really clever touch, and the bodywork squashes and stretches a little bit to help give them more life. It works really well, and I'm surprised that Ardman haven't tried doing more stuff like this. I could really see this working well as its own TV series. Hell, they still managed to put in some good gags. I love the white car who moves out from under where the birds are sitting. And speaking as someone whose car gets pooed on by seagulls every time I clean it, I just wish my car could do that. In fact, the ads were so popular they even spawned toys, which is really impressive considering Ardman have had ad campaigns that have been even more popular than this that didn't get toys. So bravo to them. But Let's take a look at an ad that they did that does have toys linked to it, but not from how popular the ads themselves were. Yep, we can't have an ad made without at least one thing involving Wallace and Gromit, and they've done a ton of ads over the years. We've looked at their DFS ad before, but now to a whole series of ads they've done for N-Power. There's not too much to talk about here in terms of how it functions as ads. I mean, it's N-Power, it's a gas and electric company. They haven't got much going for them in terms of identity. But the ads themselves are basically super quick shorts of the two in a similar vein to the cracking contraption short, such as Wallace inventing a pie cannon for a football game. 
which thank god he didn't have a mash and curry slingshot to go with it, that would have been a horribly messy disaster. Making a makeshift widescreen TV with a lot of smaller TVs, though this does remind me a lot of the movie Sliver, which is really something I don't want to think about in the context of Wallace doing. And of course something else we didn't need to imagine or see, Naked Wallace. Joking aside, I love these ads because it's basically just the pair living their lives and being the same lovable characters they've always been. We could watch these guys do just about anything and it'd be fun. Well, almost anything. Plus, it's cool to see Aardman still be creative with these ads, even though, again, they didn't really need to be, but it's good to see them putting just as much effort into these as they would anything else. And to make sure that anything that has Wallace and Gromit in it is good, and that's awesome, so thanks for that, boys. But let's move on to an ad that I'm surprised Aardman didn't use Wallace and Gromit for. Yep, it's the franchise of Aardmans that people often forget about, and I get the feeling that some people at Aardman themselves wish they could forget about. Pip and Pog, weirdly advertising something that's made for kids. I would say that's like getting Rick and Morty to advertise kid-friendly junk food, but, well, they've kind of done that as well. These were made between the initial first short and the TV series, so the ads are more in tune with the itchy and scratchy style humour of the first short, rather than the monkey dust style humour of the TV series, which was probably the best way to go. As adult as the first short intended to be, compared to what we have now, it's pretty tame and kids can still watch it. And these ads are pretty funny, as short as they can be, and really do capture the feel of the first short, but the pacing is much faster, which works perfectly for me, since I did find the first one to be a bit too long-winded. But it's still the same passive-aggressive cartoon violence that we love from these two, and the animation, timing, and voice acting, which is still provided by Joanna Wake and Andrew Wilson, which is great that they came back for this ad, is still as good as always. What have you got, Paul? <laughs> Ooh, creamy Dairy Lee Dunkers. We get them stuffing their faces into cream, feeding each other dynamite, or knocking a bell over their heads. That sounds slightly dirty, but maybe that's just me. I do just wish they would have had them bring out their Laurence Olivier and John Giel good voices again. I admit, I have no idea what made them want to use Pip and Pog to advertise these products. I mean, like I said, it would have made more sense for Wallace and Gromit to do it. Hell, Ardman have even done ads for other Dairy Lee products and they still didn't have Wallace and Gromit in them. But who cares, it's always fun seeing Pip and Pog. Whether they're beating each other up with shells, dunking their heads in cream, or eating heroin, they're always funny, even if they do look like walking potatoes. Speaking of which... So, let's take a look at a slightly more recent Ardman ad. They're Walker's Crisp Ads. So this is a rare time when they actually used a real piece of food in stop motion, which is a really tricky thing to do because, of course, unlike plasticine, food is constantly changing slightly when it's out in the open, so you've not only got to be methodical with working with it, but you've got to be fast. But clearly it worked out here with Mr. Potato Head, though this one is not voiced by Don Rickles, as much as I'd love to see that. Ironically, Rickles sounds like the name of a brand of crisps. Surprise Disney never sees that opportunity to make their own brand of crisps called Rickles with Mr. Potato Head's face on it. What the hell am I talking about? No, in fact, Walker's long-standing spokesperson and football commentator Gary Lineker provides the voice of the spud. Then they remove 70% of the saturated fat compared to standard Walker's crisps. Handsome devil. And they even go so far as to make it look like him, which is not only hilarious, but also slightly eerie in how much it really does look like him. And I thought I looked like Mr. Potato Head. Beyond that, it's just your typical spokesperson talking in a white void explaining why the product is good ad, but the quirky animation and visuals do make it memorable, so much so that they actually put the image of the Lineker Spud on the packet for a few years, which I actually do remember. They also did a second ad for the Walker's Cheesehead Crisps, which also sounds really dirty, with a character of the same name. I couldn't find who voiced the guy, not sure if it's another sort of celebrity, but it's still a fun ad. He's a bit- <laughs> Cheesehead by name and cheesehead by nature! In fact, Arben have had a long history of using Mr. Potato Head in ads. In the 90s, they also used him for advertising Burger King fries, which you can use any big names you want. It's not going to make those grease strips any less gross tasting. And this time, he looked and sounded more like what you would imagine. Hey, what about potatoes? Still no Don Rickles, but Miss Potato Head has had a lot of different voices over the years, all of which 
do sound vaguely Jewish. Aside from Lineker, either way, these ads were more elaborate and had higher production values, which makes sense when you've not only got Burger King money behind you, Walker's probably lost a lot of their profit trying to figure out why they changed their name from Lay's in the UK, but usually it focused on Mr. Potato Head promoting some sort of new meal at Burger King, and some of them were pretty funny. I especially like the one where he has a lawyer next to him when he's making a statement. On behalf of Burger King, it's a privilege to introduce the fries that'll change history. Still less stupid than some of the things that Trump's lawyers have had to stop him from saying, and at least this guy goes bald with dignity. But in both ads, I do have to wonder why Mr. Potato Head is promoting the eating of his brethren in a deep fried form. Then again, with those massive eyes and fixed grin, he has always looked a little creepy. Maybe he's a closet sadist and does the deed himself. Though he's still less creepy than Burger King's future mascot. But yeah, it makes about as much sense as Foghorn Leghorn promoting Kentucky Fried Chicken. If you want great chicken, go to Kentucky Fried Chicken. It's the only place to get America's favorite chicken. Wait, that actually happened? And so, as we normally do, we close off with a music video, and when it came to choices this year, it was obvious. I had to go with the Spice Girls music video, if simply because it finally gives me an excuse to make jokes about this band. I can probably guess that people younger than me probably have no idea who the Spice Girls are, and that's not much of a surprise considering they were very much a flash in the pan sort of band. But to sum up, they were a British pop girl band who were formed by the guy who would go on to create American Idol, yes, seriously, and for pretty much just one year they were the biggest band in the world in the late 90s, but they fizzled out pretty quickly and after the disaster of their movie spin-off Spice World, they all went their separate ways, leaving Simon Fuller, the guy who put them together, to make a new band that literally had his name stamped on it, which spawned the teen musical sitcom genre. <laughs> And as mentioned before, then made another show which spawned the modern reality TV show generation. You bastard. Regardless of that, the Spice Girls did make some good songs, like Two Become One and Spice Up Your Life, but we're not here to talk about their music. We're here to talk about a music video. The overall narrative of the music video is rather loose, mostly about two boys finding a bunch of giant gacha capsules and coming across fairies that look like the Spice Girls and other giant toys. In fact, the song itself is pretty inconsequential to the video. After a while, I'm more interested in what I'm seeing rather than what I'm hearing. I just want to watch this and check out some of these funky looking fairies, which, as you'd imagine, was the main contribution Armin provided with the stop motion puppets. And I must say, I do believe that these models set a very not true to life body image. Posh Spice was way skinnier than that. Welcome to Jokes from 2003. Also, I think Scary Spice was misnamed because Jesus, the eyes on Ginger Spice's puppet, those will stare into your soul. How dare you take one of our most beloved red-headed cuties and turn them into this? That is a war crime in 50 countries, sir. I have to say the designs of the models is very unique for Artman. It reminds me a lot of something you'd see in a Leica movie, but the thing it reminds me of mostly, and I know this is the most random thing to come to mind, is the littlest elf from the series of Unfortunate Events movie. Granted that was CGI, but it was made to emulate stop motion style, and the rictus grins on the models here, and the mix of charming with creepy, it really does remind me of that little bit from the movie. Though sadly Jude Law doesn't come in to take us to a story of tragedy, darkness, and needlessly overcomplicated plots. Yeah, I said it, your writing sucks, Lemony Snicket, whose name sounds like the rejected idea for a lemon-flavoured Snickers bar. What were we talking about again? Oh right, the Spice Girls. The integration with live action is also really, really good. Unlike Peter Gabriel's music video, which had Peter painstakingly shot within the stop motion process, here it's more like a Roger Rabbit situation where the kids in question are acting like the Spice Fairies are there and then they're animated in afterwards. But it's done really seamlessly and I have to give the kids credit because they sell it really well. Well, apart from this part where the kid looks surprisingly bored before reacting to the Rubik's Cube opening up. You've just seen something that should blow your little mind, son. Tell your face. Also, I do love this bit where the kid goes into the Rubik's Cube and his friend has to solve it to get him back out. Not only is that hilarious, because if that was me, by the time I figured it out, the guy inside would look like Julian Assange when he got dragged out of the Ecuadorian embassy, but it just reminds me so much of that Rubik the Amazing Cube sketch from Robot Chicken. There you are. I'll bring you back, Rubik. Friendless nerd kids solve you blindfolded all the time. Though I suppose it doesn't matter because he never does come out of the cube and the other kid just leaves him in the giant gotcha machine and then he becomes a fairy, which leaves us on this terrifying image. 
Thanks for that. Regardless, I like the tone and atmosphere of this video. It really does capture that childhood sense of wonder and imagination. It kind of reminds me of Winnie the Pooh in that regard, just with sexy fairies that look like pop stars instead. Which, that's a word I never thought I'd hear in the same sentence as Winnie the Pooh. Sexy. Then again, blood is another one I never thought I'd hear in relation to it either, and look what happened here. Wait, how did the sequel get that high a rating? Either way, it's not as good as the two previous album music videos we've looked at, but this is a fun video, and it does have great animation and visuals to it, and, as always, has that great album and charm and imagination to it, which is why I'll always keep coming back to this company and the amazing stuff they produce. We'll probably do something else again next year to give Aardman a chance to recharge and give me more stuff to talk about, but until then, we'll see you for the next video. Bye!